now from the Rayburn House office building on Capitol Hill, where in just a a couple of minutes we'll have live coverage of a House hearing on the upcoming elections in Pakistan. Witnesses include former Senate Democratic leader Tom Daschle. Live coverage from the House Oversight Subcommittee on Security and Foreign Affairs to begin shortly here on C-SPAN 2. Good morning. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled Pakistani Elections, Will They Be Free and Fair or Fraudulently Flawed, will come, uh, fundamentally flawed, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that uh, the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements. However, uh, Mr. Yarmouth, we're, we're happy to have an opening statement from you as well when it comes to that if you'd like. Uh, without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for coming here today and, and assisting us in this hearing. Uh, we're going to continue our sustained oversight of United States policy toward Pakistan. Here in the States, we're well into our longest ever presidential campaign. And the future course of the United States national security is at front and center as an issue. On January 8th, as New Hampshire voters braved the cold to vote in the first in the nation primary another election that very same day, a parliamentary election halfway around the world in Pakistan will also have a profound effect and con consequences on U.S. national security. Uh, we've noted in previous hearings that Pakistan is at a crossroads. After a year of extremist violence spreading throughout its western regions, an ambivalent military response and increasing pressure from pro-democracy groups, President Musharraf declared a state of emergency on November 3rd. Pakistan's emerging civil society appeared to be the main target. President Musharraf sacked judges who refused to surrender their independence. He jailed lawyers, human rights advocates, and political opposition leaders. He banned public political gatherings. He muzzled the nascent independent media. And worst of all, he turned Pakistan's guns on its civil society instead of on Taliban and al-Qaeda. The Bush administration initially made some gestures to pressure President Musharraf to reverse course. Ambassador Ann Patterson, for example, made very important and visible efforts to highlight the detention of lawyers and the crackdown on independent media. However, the administration, especially recently, has appeared to undermine the pro-democracy message. Deputy Secretary of State John Negroponte and Assistant Secretary of State Richard Bauscher continued to refer to Musharraf as an indispensable ally. President Bush said that President Musharraf hadn't crossed any lines by imposing the state of emergency. And just two weeks ago, Ambassador Bauscher referred to the state of emergency as, and I quote, a bump in the road. I'm concerned that such statements greatly undermine U.S. credibility with the Pakistani people. We should never forget that the Pakistani people are our indispensable and long-term ally, not necessarily any one leader whether it be President Musharraf or anyone else. Over the last several weeks, there have been some positive developments. President Musharraf resigned as Army Chief. The leaders of the two mainstream opposition parties, Benazir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif, are now back in Pakistan. And President Musharraf revoked the state of emergency just this past weekend. Still, much of the damage remains. Judges have not been reinstated. Media outlets now operate under a code of conduct restricting criticism of the government. 
Leading opposition lawyers remain under arrest. The Election Commission lacks independence. The voter rolls continue to inspire little confidence. And evidence mounts that raises serious concerns about President Musharraf using the power of the state to gain unfair advantage in the elections. For example, this is a photograph shown on the screen over there that was taken last week depicting an armed Pakistani security official actually posting signs on behalf of President Musharraf's political party, the PMLQ. There's also evidence that the crackdown against civil society continues, notwithstanding formal revocation of the state of emergency. This picture on the screen is of security forces beating women at a peaceful protest taken just a few days ago. We note that this confrontation happened after the state of emergency was purportedly lifted. Taking all of this into account, there are grave concerns and many questions about the prospects for free and fair parliamentary elections less than three short weeks from now on January 8th. How will the code of conduct imposed on the media allow the kind of unbiased political expression necessary for a free and fair election? How much of a chilling effect will there be on a robust political opposition when activists continue to fear crackdowns and arrests? How accurate are the voter rolls going to be going into this election? And what effect will Nawaz Sharif's ineligibility to stand for election have? How will political parties campaign in the western regions of the country that have been inflamed by Taliban and al-Qaeda violence? How will the removal of judges unwilling to go along with President Musharraf and the lack of an independent election commission hamper the ability to ward off and root out corruption and unfair practices at the polls? We're also concerned that it, it merits to take a few minutes now before the heat of the election day itself to discuss the following. First, what standards must be met for an election to be deemed free and fair? What is the dividing line between minor problems and massive election fraud? Second, how should the United States react if the international community and credible election observers deem it to be a fundamentally flawed election? I look forward to engaging with our distinguished panel before us today about these particular questions. I want to thank all of you for sharing your expertise with the Congress and with the American people. In particular, I look forward to hearing from your experiences since you've closely monitored the buildup to these Pakistani parliamentary elections uh, with visits there in the not too distant past. So thank you. And, and Mr. Yarmouth, if you have some comments, we'd love to hear those as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really don't have too much. I want to thank you for and commend you for holding this hearing. It's a, a very important topic. And I just, I'm particularly interested in um, an assessment of just what the, the risks and um, the possibilities of, uh, are from United States relationships in Pakistan. And because I've seen in a number of cases throughout many years that there are usually a lot of unintended consequences from our involvement uh, or our relationships within a country as, as in terms of the results of elections and um, the perception of the United States as a result of that. So I'm, I'm very interested in the witness's testimony and the discussion that we'll have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yarmouth. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses that are here with us today. I want to begin by introducing each of the witnesses on the panel. Uh, we have, starting from my left, Senator Thomas A. Daschle, who is a former two-time Senate Majority and Minority Leader in the Senate. Senator Daschle recently co-authored a pre-election assessment report after he had led a team to Pakistan on behalf of the National Democratic Institute. Mr. Thomas E. Garrett is the Regional Program Director for the Middle East and North Africa for the International Republican Institute. The IRI was awarded the Election Observer Grant on behalf of the United States Government and released a survey of the Pakistan public opinion just last week. Mr. Mark L. Schneider is the Senior Vice President of the International Crisis Group and a former United States Peace Corps Director. The ICG closely monitors events on the ground in Pakistan and has employees stationed there to assist in that project as well. Welcome to all of you and thank you again. It's the policy of the subcommittee to swear in our witnesses before we take testimony, so I please ask you to stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The witness will please reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. You have full written statements that you've been kind enough to supply to the committee, and those will be put on the record uh, with unanimous consent. Uh, we ask that you keep your oral statements somewhere within the five-minute range. So we have a small panel here today, so we're more than happy to let you go a little bit beyond that. And we do want to hear a full assessment of your thoughts and your observations. Uh, Senator Nashville, we'll be pleased to start with you. I think you have to put that microphone on, Senator. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today, and I commend you on your opening statement, Mr. Chairman. And I'm very pleased to be uh, 
a part of the, the, the distinguished panel that uh, is appearing before you today. I, I come before you as uh, on behalf of the National Democratic Institute regarding the prospects for free and fair elections in Pakistan. I'm a member of the board of directors of NDI and, as you noted, was pleased to be able to lead a pre-election assessment to Pakistan for NDI from October 17th through the 21st. NDI has been actively involved in supporting the electoral process in Pakistan now for nearly two decades. The Institute organized the international delegations to observe the national and provincial elections in 1988, 1990, 1993, and 1997. This year, NDI is implementing a program to train political party representatives to monitor polling stations across the country on Election Day. The Institute also conducted two pre-election assessment missions to Pakistan, both prior to the imposition of martial law. The first was held in May and I led the second held in October. These missions identified a number of critical issues that needed to be addressed by the Pakistani government to improve the inclusiveness and credibility of the polls. The most recent delegation identified the following critical issues affecting these elections. First, the high incidence of election-related violence. Second, the killing and abduction of journalists and political party workers. Third, the infringement of the rights of women to vote. Fourth, the ban on political parties operating in the federally administered tribal areas. Next, the lack of regular consultation by the Election Commission with the political parties and civil society on election procedures and policies and the inaccuracy of the voters' lists. President Musharraf's recent retirement from his military post and the lifting of the state of emergency on Saturday have been welcome developments, but much remains to be done before the upcoming polls could be viewed as free and fair by any international standard. In fact, we urge the members of this committee not to be distracted by President Musharraf taking off his uniform. It has not undone the damage of eight years of military rule to the basic institutions of rule of law and democracy in Pakistan. Similarly, the lifting of the state of emergency is not alone sufficient for ensuring free and fair elections. It is only the first of many steps the government must take to avoid a further deepening of the Pakistan crisis today. Among the serious impacts of the recent state of emergency was the severe erosion of the independence of Pakistan's judiciary. Musharraf's replacement of several Supreme Court justices who threatened to rule his re-election unconstitutional undermines the democratic principle of checks and balances. Without the restoration of Chief Justice Hiptar Chaudhry and the other disposed, uh, deposed judges, public confidence in the ability of the judicial system to act independently and to ensure the transparency of the electoral process will be significantly curtailed. Lingering restrictions on the press and opposition political parties also pose a threat to free and fair elections. Vibrant independent media and political competition are important elements in free society. While many restrictions imposed during the state of emergency have been lifted, one major television station continues to be prohibited from broadcasting while others face strict limitations on the content of their political coverage. Many opposition supporters remain under arrest while their parties do not have the freedom to campaign openly. In addition, both, NDI, both of NDI's assessments identified a host of very serious and basic issues that, if not addressed, would adversely affect the election. Virtually none has been done since our first report to strengthen the prospects for free and fair elections. While the government has allowed the return of two former prime ministers, Benazar Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif, after years of exile, Sharif has been barred from standing for his seat in parliament, thus diminishing his party's ability to fully participate in these elections. The other issues identified by the NDI delegations, which remain unaddressed today, are still fundamental to an inclusive, credible, and transparent electoral process. Only elections that are viewed as legitimate by the people of Pakistan can resolve the instability that has long plagued their country. Robust institutions 
an independent judiciary, free and independent media, vibrant political parties, and transparent elections are all fundamental to a stable and democratic future for Pakistan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Garrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Yarmouth. This opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the upcoming elections in Pakistan. The International Republican Institute is actively engaged in programs to support the democratic process in Pakistan, ranging from public opinion polling to work with non-governmental organizations to a political party strengthening program. These activities have been funded through the National Endowment for Democracy. As you mentioned, with recent funding from the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, as well as the U.S. Agency for International Development, IRI has also undertaken a comprehensive elections effort that includes a pre-election assessment, deployment of long-term observers across the country, and fielding of a 65-person International Election Day observer team. I mentioned that polling is a specific activity that IRI conducts in Pakistan. Our public opinion research has revealed that Pakistanis are committed to democracy and concerned about the future direction of their country. In IRI's February 2007 poll, 81 percent were optimistic that democracy would improve their lives. Over the course of the past year, increasing numbers have expressed their desire for the Army to remove itself from civilian government and for President Musharraf to resign his post as Army Chief of Staff. Even when President Musharraf was at the peak of his popularity in IRI polling, strong majorities supported the return of exile leaders Benazir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif in order to contest elections. Our most recent poll, conducted just this past month, found that voters overwhelmingly opposed the President's declaration of emergency. Voters were also opposed in large numbers to the various measures that accompanied the state of emergency declaration. For instance, 71 percent opposed the suspension of the Constitution. 76 percent of Pakistanis opposed the closure of TV news channels. 76 percent opposed the crackdown on lawyers. And 62 percent supported the demonstrations you saw on the street against the declaration. On the day before President Musharraf declared the state of emergency, IRI had a pre-election assessment team concluding its eight-day visit to the country. While there, we met with uh, 12 political parties, representatives of the Election Commission, uh, civil society and media as we traveled throughout the country visiting Islamabad, Quetta, Karachi, Lahore. What we found in this pre-election assessment was a strong commitment on the part of civil society and political parties to engage in the democratic process. Even among those who identified as early as November, October, a lack of a level playing field in the pre-election environment. One of the overriding concerns expressed to our pre-election assessment team was the continued decline in law and order within Pakistan. People who intended to stand for candidate, uh, excuse me, stand for office expressed fears about their personal safety while electioneering. The media told us they were worried about the vulnerability of their reporters and camera people as they tried to carry out their work to bring information to the public. But even these concerns of election period instability did not result in the majority of Pakistanis we spoke to from saying that they agreed with the governmental ban to limit rallies or to stop political gatherings. Questions as to the capacity of the Election Commission of Pakistan to meet electoral needs in a timely fashion were often raised with IRI's delegation. One consistent issue of concern was the accuracy of the official voter list and the possible exclusion of eligible voters on Election Day. Our election assessment also noted the important role played by Pakistan's non-state media. If you look back to 1999, the year during which General Musharraf took power in Pakistan, you can see the limited number of private media that existed at the time. During these last several years, media outlet numbers have grown tremendously, and today they play a very important role in the roadmap to democracy in Pakistan. In IRI's most recent polling, the media actually outstrips institutions such as the judiciary and the army as the highest rated institution in the country. That makes it all the more important, we believe, that private television stations that have been removed from the air, some restored, 
but also still have media curbs in place against them, be allowed to report freely and fully on this election campaign period. The declaration of emergency on November 3 was a very significant obstacle to the restoration of democracy in Pakistan. Several of the individuals that IRI met with during that time were under detention or still face the threat of detention today. The government of Pakistan's decision to lift the emergency and proceed with election offers some hope the process towards democratization may be restored. However, I have to say it's very difficult to envision how elections conducted in a matter of only a few days and weeks under these kinds of rules, while many participants are otherwise still detained or face the threat of detention, it's very difficult to envision how these elections can achieve legitimacy in the minds of the Pakistani citizenry. Of course, it's the Pakistani citizens who will judge this election's credibility. Based upon the polling figures that we've seen, we think this will be very difficult to achieve. Within IRI, we've examined whether or not our presence as observers on this election January 8th is necessary or desirable, given the flawed conditions in which we see this election proceeding. As recently as last week, while I was in Pakistan, we met in consultation with our Pakistani partners and others as to the viability of an observer mission. But with the decision of the majority of parties to contest the election, IRI determined that its role as an NGO that promotes democracy was to work with our Pakistani partners on this elections in the hope that future elections can be improved to democratic standards. So over the next few weeks, our long-term and short-term observer delegation will be arriving in Pakistan to observe the electoral process. We will attempt to put people, observers, in all four provinces of Pakistan, depending upon security at the time. Our preliminary mission findings will be presented shortly after election day at a press briefing and within 45 days, we'll issue a comprehensive report. It is our hope that the recommendations that report contains will strengthen the future elections in Pakistan. We hope that these recommendations will set benchmarks that serve as a guide for Pakistani election officials, political parties, and civil society on how future elections may improve the country's democratic standing. Just before I close, let me say that much of my comments were geared towards the uh, role of the government in this election. As a result of our pre-election assessment, I'd also like to point to the role played by political parties in Pakistan, including those in the opposition. We think that a commitment by the parties to run issue-based rather than personality-centered election campaigns would break with the disastrous cycle of elections that have taken place in Pakistan since 1970. We think it's an important role for the parties to come forward with political programs or platforms that motivate the people of Pakistan to participate in elections. If you look at our polling, the issues which predominate are not those concerned with foreign policy or the war on terror, but for Pakistanis, it's bread and butter issues such as inflation. When presented with a number of issues and asked to select what was most important in determining which party they would vote for, 77% of Pakistanis chose economics-related issues. Inflation was the top issue by far, having been selected by 53% of the respondents. Just finally, in closing, let me say that restoring public as well as international confidence in the electoral process in Pakistan is going to be very, very difficult. But we can see again through two years of polling that the urge among Pakistanis for democracy remains strong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Schneider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me again express our appreciation to you and to the subcommittee uh, for maintaining this focus on U.S. relations with Pakistan and on the Musharraf government's performance on democracy, extremism, and terrorism. This hearing asks whether the parliamentary elections now scheduled for January 8th are going to be fair and free or fundamentally flawed. And it's appropriate that the question is asked now because election day is too late. And unfortunately, the answer today is that Pakistan's parliamentary elections will be fatally flawed unless fundamental political, electoral, and legal conditions are rapidly improved. Today, those conditions do not permit a fair and free election. It is December 20th. Martial law was lifted only five days ago. The elections will take place in 18 days. There is a very short time. There is nothing like time for a long-term observation. That was long ago that the observation should have begun, and there should have already been a finding 
that the conditions that are required do not exist. Election Day remembers the final act of a democratic drama. The first act is establishment of neutral rules and standards that all of the major players agree will permit a level playing field. That does not exist. Act two is for all of the parties to be able to name their own candidates and then to be able to campaign freely and the press to be able to ask their questions of all parties. That again does not exist. It's only finally when you get to the final act, if you will, when all eligible voters are permitted to vote, when votes are honestly and accurately counted and reported, and when the complaints are heard before a neutral body, then one can say that the full drama is complete. At the moment, all of those factors are in high question as to whether or not those conditions will be met. Because the, the emergency government of General Musharraf and now the current post-December 15th government of President Musharraf have violated the country's constitution and undermined the essential conditions for a fair and free election. As you noted, I was in Pakistan the week before the emergency was declared. At the beginning of the week, the assumption was that there would be no emergency because people did not think the court would dare to rule against Musharraf on the two key constitutional challenges to his reelection, wearing a uniform at the same time as being president and attempting to be reelected within two years of holding a, um, an office as a military officer. By the end of the week, the views had changed. And that really gives you an indication of the timing for his action to declare an emergency. By the end of the week, in fact, it was viewed that the Supreme Court would disqualify him on one or both of the constitutional grounds. And in addition, his government faced contempt charges for having refused to abide by the court decision to permit Nawaz Sharif to return to Pakistan from Saudi Arabia and had forcibly deported him. He essentially preempted the court on November 3rd. He imposed an emergency rule. He voided the Constitution. He essentially adopted martial law. And there was a key disconnect between his justification of terrorism, the threat of terrorism, and his actions. The first people arrested were not terrorists. They were political party leaders. The first people released from prison were terrorists. In fact, those that had been linked to suicide bombings. They were exchanged for army hostages. Of the dozen or so paragraphs in the proclamation of emergency, two were solely linked to terrorism, 10 complained about an independent judiciary. His actions in time reveal his fundamental motive, which was to maintain power. The reason for acting was to retain political power, not to fight terrorism, and martial law was the means. To be frank, everybody in Pakistan, I think, was surprised by the level of repression that followed that decision. You've already heard some of it, thousands rounded up and detained, Supreme Court justices, other justices removed. Remember, 13 of the 17 Supreme Court justices essentially were detained and have been fired. And more than 40 of the provincial high courts, essentially the state Supreme Courts, have also been fired. This, the independent judiciary has been undermined fundamentally. And I'm going to get to the point, which is that the linkage between the judiciary and fair and free elections in Pakistan is fundamental. Now, you have to understand that the reason that he did not use the emergency provision of the Constitution and apply that as president, which I put into the testimony, is that that would not have voided the roles of the other agencies of government. It would have kept the Supreme Court, which had the power under the Constitution, to review his actions. He didn't do that. He voided the Constitution. He essentially took the country back to 1999 and worse, because what he said was that there will be no review of my actions by the court or any other institution. In fact, now, when he lifted the emergency last Saturday, he acknowledged what he had done. He said, and I'm quoting, have I done anything constitutionally illegal? Yes, I did on November 3rd. His order deprived the courts of the authority to challenge any executive order for unconstitutionality and gave him the power to amend the Constitution. 
before they were placed under confinement, seven members of the Supreme Court, a majority of the panel of 11, ruled that his actions were illegal and unconstitutional. And then you ask the question about the reaction in Pakistan to what has occurred and to U.S. actions. Pakistanis and others found it utterly incomprehensible that President Bush asserted that Musharraf had not crossed any red line in terms of undemocratic actions. This is the second time he crossed the red line. The first time was 1999, and the second time was when he voided the Constitution on November 3rd. Now afterwards, I think the United States, the UK, and the EU made appropriate statements expressing the view that the emergency rule was unwise and the martial law abuses were unacceptable. And it essentially said that he needed to give up his army post, hold fair and free elections, and end the emergency rule. But it's interesting that the United States government at all levels has been utterly silent about the importance of an independent judiciary. It's been utterly silent about the need to restore the court and to restore the judges who've been fired. And that's a tragedy. Now, to the casual observer, it may appear that Musharraf has met those three conditions. He gave up the army post on November 28th. He announced the parliament, parliamentary elections would be held. And he issued the order Saturday ending the emergency. Unfortunately, he did so with caveats, with restrictions, and with limitations which violate fundamental freedoms and which make fair and free elections highly dubious. The day before he lifted the emergency, he imposed six new constitutional amendments, again, which challenged the role of the judiciary. And his order simply said that nothing that had occurred during the emergency period could be reviewed by the courts or by parliament. And by the way, some of those items, it's important to recognize what they were. First, of course, it said that the two-year bar no longer would apply president. Second, that the dismissal of the Supreme Court judges and high court judges can't be challenged by or before any court. An amendment to the 1952 Army Act made retroactive permits military courts now to try civilians for a wide range of offenses, including causing public mischief. Another decree threatens freedom of association by giving the new hand-picked high court the authority to disbar lawyers. And again, none of these decrees are subject to review under his order. The linkage between the judiciary and elections. The Election Commission of Pakistan is comprised of a retired Supreme Court justice and a serving high court judge from each of the four provinces. Two of those remain unfilled. By permanently barring the previous Supreme Court and provincial high court judges who refused to bow to his edict, he's basically assured that the commission represents only hand-picked judges that he's satisfied with. But it's even more than that. At, in every province, above the polling station, when the, when the returns are, are collated, if you will, at a district level, let's say first at a municipal level and here, let's say, at a county level, there are what are called district returning officers, returning officers, and assistant returning officers who run that. They manage it. In Pakistan, they are either district judges assistant district judges or civil judges, and they all have to respond to the, high, to the high court of that province. And so the judiciary in Pakistan fundamentally is responsible for running the elections. That judiciary has now been totally tarnished by Musharraf's actions. And in addition, it should be remembered that whenever there are complaints made, those complaints go to an electoral tribunal made up of judges. And then from there to the high court in each province and to the Supreme Court. Again, courts which now are filled with hand-picked Musharraf choices. By stacking the full range of high courts, including, by the way, now naming a totally new high court for Islamabad, he essentially has hijacked the electoral process. In terms of ensuring credible elections, could it still be done? Possibly, but you would have to do a range of actions. One, establish a neutral caretaker government. That doesn't exist. He's refused to do so. Establish a neutral and accepted electoral commission. 
He, tomorrow he could go and ask the parties for their recommendations, and there are scores of, of acceptable uh, individuals if he would restore the judges who could form that commission. Uh, the voters' roles, uh, you've heard just mention of them, but what occurred was that the, the commission established new voters' roles for this election. By August, it had come up with 52 million names. There was a protest from the parties because in 2002, there were 72 million names. It was clear that, that something was wrong. It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said to the Electoral Commission, fix this. What the Electoral Commission did was say, okay, here's a 2002 list. Here's the list we came, out, came up with. Those who aren't on our list that were in 2002 will add. They added about 25 million names. Nobody reviewed who died. Nobody reviewed who wasn't on, who shouldn't have been on that list because they perhaps were terrorists that, and in jail, nothing. The party said, put this on a, a, a mechanism where we can electronically go through it and try and say these people are dead, these people on, on our party lists are not on it. And when we were in, when, when I was in Islamabad, I spoke to the Electoral Commission and they said, yes, we can do it and we're figuring out how to and we will do it shortly. That has not yet been done. So you still have voters' roles, which are highly suspect. Finally, this, you've heard the mention of the code of conduct, and so I won't go into that. But it basically does establish serious curbs on public statements, press statements, and what the parties can say. Let me just note as well that as one looks down the road, what is needed? Full restoration of the Constitution full restoration of independent judiciary, voiding the emergency period of press prohibition, press ordinances. By the way, they, they provide for criminal penalties, not simply civil penalties. Three years, up to three years in jail, in addition to $200,000 fine and loss of television licenses. And that's for anyone who publicly criticizes Musharraf, the military, the emergency, the, rule, the, um, the, the emergency rule, or foreign affairs. Establish a neutral electoral commission and a neutral caretaker government and consult with the parties on all of the issues relative to the elections. And release from house arrest judges and their lawyers and the others detained for engaging in democratic protests. The U.S. and Western allies must recognize that fair and free elections are the best option for a secular, moderate parliamentary majority, a unified country against extremist jihadi organizations, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, a rigged election will produce the worst of all possible worlds. The election will not be credible, the parliament will not be credible, and the parliament will be controlled by a Musharraf-linked majority of religious parties who themselves have links to the Taliban. And the country will be fundamentally and sharply divided. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stein. Thank all of you. And, and uh, we went a little bit over the five-minute line as we thought we would, but I think it was worth listening to what you all had to say, and, and I appreciate it. The very last thing that Mr. Schneider said, uh, saving the last, best for last, I think, is really the crux of the matter, isn't it? Uh, that the United States and Western allies have to recognize that free and fair elections are the best option for a secular and moderate parliamentary majority and a unified country against extremist jihadi organizations, the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Do all of the panelists agree with that statement that that's really the best option here? Well, Mr. Ms. Chairman, I certainly do. I think Mr. Schneider uh, said it very well, and uh, I, I'm concerned. And I, I, I will say that in answer to your questions, I'll, I'll speak for myself and not for NDI. Uh, but uh, I'm concerned, as he noted, that uh, there has been far too much silence with regard to the United States' position on many of these fundamental questions in Pakistan today. But your question is appropriate, and I would answer in the affirmative. Mr. Garrett. Yes, sir, I agree. I think that um, really our future policy should be determined in large part by whether or not these elections are conducted in any type of a rigged or free and fair manner. I mean, when I look at your polls, Mr. Garrett, and I see the number of people responding to this uh, declaration uh, and all that's followed it or whatever, I'm hard pressed to think how without legitimacy, I mean, if there aren't free and fair elections and somebody isn't given a legitimate mandate, how they're going to marshal all the people in their country to, to help us and other countries push back against terrorists and al-Qaeda. Uh, you're going to have a continuation, I would think, of what we see now is sort of the government fighting those secular forces, moderate forces, lawyers, judges and everything just to stay in power as opposed to 
focusing on these external and some internal problems. Am I right? I would agree. Uh, so following that, Mr. Garrett, I have an issue. Are you at all concerned that your IRA's mission is going to be seen as, a, as some sort of a, um, a validation of what might very likely be illegitimate elections? And how are you guarding against being put in that position? Well, it's difficult to say what the final report that we would produce 45 days after the election is going to say at this time. However, uh, our pre-election statement, which we have issued publicly, it's on our website, does say that we see this as a very troubled uh, election, uh, pre-election environment, flawed. Uh, as I mentioned in my statement, I believe if the political parties of Pakistan had decided not to contest, and they're saying that they're contesting this knowing it's going to be highly flawed. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be there. But we do feel like we need to stand with the political parties of Pakistan as they do make that courageous stand themselves for democracy and election. So. I'm going to ask uh, just a series of questions. And Mr. Garrett, if you feel uncomfortable answering them because you've got a report coming out afterwards, then just right. defer. But I would like the Senator and Mr. Schneider to answer. I want to talk about what are the standards that have to be met for free and fair. Uh, if uh, the judges aren't reinstated. Have they failed to meet the standard? I don't see how you can meet the standard without a restoration of the rule of law, and the rule of law cannot be reinstated without the restoration of the judges. So I think it's pretty fundamental. Agree, Mr. Schneider? Absolutely. You want to defer, Mr. Garrett, or make a Let's comment? See. Okay. If you don't reinstate to the media the ability to report on election occurrences, including criticizing the, the, the President and other authorities on that, how can you have a free and fair election? Would that failure to, uh, to reinstate their ability to do that, to not make them subject to a $200,000 fine, and loss of a license, and possible imprisonment for reporting a critical aspect, uh, if that doesn't occur between now and January 8th, how can we infer that there are, are free and fair elections? Is that a fair statement? I think that is a fair statement, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Schneider. Absolutely. Uh, if we don't release from prison people like I'd see Sassan, uh, the president of the Bar Association, a, a senator at the PPP, a, a known a democracy uh, proponent, uh, and others that are imprisoned or whatever, how can we term it a free and fair election? Am I right? Exactly Mr. right. Schneider. Uh, the voter polls. Uh, senator Daschle, you made mention of that in your report, and uh, Mr. Schneider mentioned it again. 25 million people all of a sudden mysteriously appear and get thrown on there. If that isn't corrected by allowing the parties to go through and scrutinize and make comments about who perhaps ought not to be on, for whatever uh, infirmity or ought to be on it because they're missing, how can that be termed a free and fair election? Am I correct? Precisely. Mr. Schneider? Yeah. I mean, the, the problem that I'm seeing here is we've got three weeks to go, some very, very serious impediments on that, and it's almost, and I didn't want to put Mr. Garrett in this position because he's going to put a report out of it, how in the world do you even think that there can possibly be free and fair elections unless President Musharraf has a sudden uh, turn of heart here and, and within the next couple of days changes all of these things? And I think it would be uh, arguably possible to do if you did things today or tomorrow. Uh, but anytime beyond that, you just run out of time and you don't have it. So I think the next question is, how does the United States react? How ought we react if all of these things don't get changed so that the elections are put on a footpath uh, toward free and fair elections? Well, Mr. Chairman, again, speaking for myself, I would say that the United States needs to be far more assertive far more vocal, far more aggressive in stating our position. Uh, as Mr. Schneider noted and, and we have noted this morning, uh, the silence is a message, and that silence cannot go unnoted. We, we just passed the omnibus, as, uh, as uh, no one knows better than the Chairman and, uh, and Mr. Yarmouth, but that conditionality in the omnibus is a beginning, but it is only a beginning. I think it is a very uh, a mellow statement with regard to what it is this government needs to do. But you have to start somewhere. I would hope that we could build on that in the future. And I would hope that we could be a lot more assertive with regard to the conditionality of assistance. Uh, but, but most importantly, in the next three weeks, and we won't be in, you won't be in session during the next three weeks, I think it is very critical that the State Department step up to the plate and voice these concerns with a lot more more uh, vigor than I have seen so far. Yeah, I, have, I have to agree with you. My problem is that other than Ambassador Patterson, who has done uh, arguably a, a good job on at least some of these aspects and being outspoken, I am really concerned about uh, Mr. Negroponte and Mr. Boucher and their statements to say that it hasn't crossed any red line um, to me is absurd. I mean, he crossed it when he declared the, uh, the state of emergency and all the other things that followed from it. 
But then for Richard Bauscher to indicate that it's a bump in the road, if it happened in this country, I don't think we'd look at it as a bump in the road. And, and so I don't know what hope uh, we can hold out for this administration really doing that. For the record, I'll make note that the Senator referenced action that was taken on uh, spending bills, appropriation bills last night, uh, where the House and the Senate uh, decided to put some constraints on the uh, financial aid that the United States was given to Pakistan. Uh, a significant amount of money, $50 million, was held aside until the Secretary of State can make certain representations about uh, corrections of status, conditions that we mentioned here today, the judges and others being uh, put out of jail, reinstated to the bench, um, the media being given back the license that it had to report and so on. Um, so that's it. Also uh, money being put more towards development and education and other things as opposed to uh, just indiscriminate money to the Basharaf regime to do what they want to do. Uh, and also directing some money away from money that had been spent militarily for things like F-16s uh, and focusing it more on the uh, battle against terrorism and, and, and the Taliban. Although the administration's surprising remark to that was they didn't quite know how that was going to happen because the F-16s were so important uh, to the uh, to the Musharraf and the military, notwithstanding the fact that F-16s, to my knowledge, haven't been used to fight uh, terrorism and the, the Taliban and Al Qaeda in that region of the world. Nor do they need Orient submarines or some of the other things that it was being spent on. So, those are the things that were, were referenced there. I'm going to uh, have Mr. Yarmouth ask some questions. I have a number of other questions that I'd like to get back to, but I do want to let the other panelists in. I welcome Mr. Van Hollen, who's good enough to join us as well. Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the testimony of the witnesses. Um, I'm going to give the President a benefit of a doubt for a second, and I don't usually do that, but I'll do it for the time being. Uh, is he in, essentially, are we in, a, a no-win situation in that uh, the likelihood we're going to have to deal with President Musharraf in some way um, in terms of our uh, fight against uh, radical Islam uh, versus our desire to have a pure democracy, an American-style democracy, is, is he, how, how much of a thin line is he treading here in terms of the, the real politic of the situation? I think that there really this is, that's a fundamental question. I think that the mistake that's been made is to assume that the uh, Pakistan military is solely made up of President, of, of President Musharraf. It's not. The Pakistan military has, for its own reasons, if it's working with a civilian democratically elected government, efforts to try and stop the Islamic jihadi forces which have been carrying out, as you know, uh, suicide bombings and other attacks. Um, the issue is that politically, President Musharraf has linked himself to religious parties which are linked to some of the extremists, including Taliban, in order to gain a majority, he hopes, in the parliament. That's the problem. All of the pressures on him in terms of his own political interests are to go soft on the terrorists. On the other hand, both Benazir Bhutto, the PPP, and the, um, and the PML uh, and of Nawaz Sharif, their instinct and their desire is to have a secular, moderate majority and they will be even more concerned about putting restrictions on the religious extremists. So in a sense, it's win-win for us to press for a fair and free democratic election, which would produce, as we've heard from the, the polling numbers, a moderate majority. And I believe that if, we're st if the United States is taking that position, along with its allies, the military will understand that if they take the position of supporting Musharraf against the majority of the Pakistan population, again, and put at risk their relationship in terms of aid with the United States and others, that's not in their institutional interest. And at some point, and I would suspect it would be sooner rather than later, they will press President Musharraf to either change significantly or remove himself. And I should say, by the way, that at this point, it seems to me there is something that the State Department can do, even at this 12th hour, and that is to specify what are those conditions that are required to provide an opportunity for a relatively credible election on January 8th. Present those, and I mean this, it's, they're not hidden. As you've heard from all of us, we all generally agree on what they are. Present those privately to President Musharraf, and to the leadership in Pakistan. And if within a number of days that they have not begun to move, then publicly say these are the things which are publicly that we've asked because we think it's crucial to a fair and free election. Because 
relatively speaking, a short time period, if the people of Pakistan see that the United States is complicit with the steps that rule out any possibility of democratic election, the future relationship with the United States is going to be, unfortunately, far worse than it is today. I would only add that if we learned anything from history, it is that personality-driven foreign policy will ultimately lead to a disaster within any country within its, with, where it's practiced. Personality-driven policies in Iran, in the Philippines, and in many other countries today have, have complicated, not simplified, our challenges in the years to follow. We ought to learn those lessons here. The, the people of Pakistan generally are very supportive of people of the United States. But over and over again when I was there, they asked the question, where is your government? Why aren't they speaking out? Why is it that they seem to be supporting Musharraf against us? And I think we have to make it clear we're with the people of Pakistan, not with the Musharraf government. That was, that was actually going to be one of my follow-up questions, is how aware are the Pakistani people of what this government's doing, our government's doing? Apparently, they're very aware. They're very, they're very aware. aware. Very aware. Let me ask another. I, Mr. Chairman, I'm lost without the clock. I don't know when my time's up. You have about <laughs> half a second. Does that help? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, in terms of the, the, um, the ramifications for the international situation, the, the, again, our, our war on um, terror and so forth, are we at a, is the, the failure of a, a free and fair election uh, in a few weeks that we have the status quo? Is, in other words, do we have a downside from where we are now? Can it make it worse, or is, it, is there only an upside? Let me give you just one example. The already, as you know, President Musharraf's party, the, P the PMLQ, has indicated that it is going to align itself with the JUIF during the election campaign. That is the extreme religious right party that has, has been seen to be linked with Taliban. In other words, to create their majority, they're going to link themselves in the parliamentary elections and then in the parliament with that party. That means that the pressures to go after the Taliban, particularly. Remember, the Taliban military and political headquarters, according to U.S. military sources testifying before the Congress, are in and around Quetta and Peshawar. These are cities. These are not mountain, isolated mountain regions. Any effort to go after them is going to be undermined by this process of an unfair election because it's going to result in a majority of the religious right linked to parties which have their own ties to the Taliban. Okay. I'll, um, I'll yield for you know, you know, I just want to add one thing on that is, you know, we've seen this before. If we don't have free and fair elections now, when the prospects are that if they were held in that manner that uh, people that were secular probably, at least were moderate certainly, and shared interest with others would be more likely to win. You have a false, a fraudulent election or a fundamentally flawed election, uh, and one or two terms down the road here, you can end up with an entirely team, uh, a team in there that you don't even want to see. Uh, and that's why it's so disturbing to have this administration sitting on the sidelines and, and not speaking out. Mr. Van Hollen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tier Tierney, and thank you for holding this series of uh, hearings on Pakistan. Thank all our panelists, witnesses uh, here today. And I just want to uh, start by looking at the context which we find ourselves in right now in Pakistan. And I think we obviously need to look forward and anticipate what's going to happen uh, after these elections. Uh, but it's also important to remind ourselves how we got here. And we did get here in large part because the United States government under the Bush administration did not take action nearly early enough to put keep pressure on Pakistan to move in the direction of greater democratization. And essentially bought into Musharraf's argument that he was the only guy in Pakistan that was willing to stand up to the Taliban and be able to fight uh, al-Qaeda, when in fact, as you pointed out, Mr. Snyder, his ability to stay in power uh, was in part due to the fact that he uh, had at least the tacit uh, support of some of the extreme religious groups within Pakistan and that they provided him his margin, in fact, for the majority. And if you looked at sort of the secular opposition, that they, in fact, represented a much greater uh, threat, so to speak, to the Taliban 
and the extremists. And so what our policy did was reinforce uh, Musharraf. And we sort of saw this in stark terms when Musharraf recently, instead of keeping his guns trained on Al Qaeda and the extremists, actually turned against the lawyers and those fighting for democracy uh, in the streets. Uh, and so we sort of saw in very vivid form uh, when push came to shove uh, where he saw some of the threats uh, within Pakistan coming from. So I do think we've got a lot of work to do uh, dealing with the Pakistani public in letting people know that we're on the side of democracy, let the chips fall where they may. And clearly his decision to remove the chief judge uh, had everything to do with the fact that they were about to rule, uh, that he could no longer uh, serve, he couldn't serve as president because of the constitutional uh, limitations. So given that we're in that situation and we're going forward now with the elections, uh, if the elections are not perceived to be fair, uh, and given what you've all said with regard to the current uh, judges and the election you know, overseers who were all supporters of Musharraf at this point. Uh, if it's not perceived to be fair, where does that leave the United States? Uh, and what should we both be doing right now? And I, you've answered some of that. Uh, but looking, looking to the future, what kind of scenarios should we anticipate and what kind of measures should be willing to take if we judge, we the United States government judge, that the outcome uh, was not fair? Well, Mr. Van Halen, I'd say the three things that we ought to do. First, in the, as we've all said this morning, I think the most important thing in the immediate three weeks is to put as much pressure as we can uh, verbally and in other, other ways on the government to do the right thing, to make them as free and fair as they can given the limited time available to us. Uh, once the election has been held, I think it's important that we work with political leadership within the country do as much as possible to ensure that whatever the results of the election, we work with, uh, with all interested parties to enhance the institutions of government themselves and not look at, at that election as the last word, but only really the beginning of an ongoing effort to try to put Pakistan on the right path. I think that's critical. And then third, I think it's important for us to involve the international community as well. This shouldn't just be a bilateral experience. It's important for us to, to involve others as well in the region and around the, around the world and, uh, and add to that pressure on the Musharraf government and those responsible for making these decisions. But that all has to be done both in the short term and the, and the longer term uh, in a concerted way. And we can't afford to wait a day. It has to start now. I would just add to that uh, really one thing, I think, and that is that uh, instead of the conditionality applying softly to 50 out of the 300, I think it should apply to all 300 million. Uh, I think that anything that we provide thereafter should be clearly performance-based in relation to going after Taliban fully, not in a half-way manner. Uh, and that it should be based clearly on evidence that they have, in fact, taken significant steps to go after the Taliban leadership, the core leadership throughout the country, and as well as al-Qaeda. Uh, I think that that is a minimum. But clearly we're, we should be also looking for ways to strengthen our relationship with the rest of the political, not just the, the political parties, but civil society as well the human rights groups, many of which have, their leaders have been detained, the, um, uh, the, the women's organizations, all of those that represent civil society, we should be increasing our support for them. This is not going to remain, e even if this outcome of this, these elections is, as we believe, not going to be fair and free. That is not going to be the future of Pakistan. I would, if I could just add to that, uh, I, we feel very strongly at IRI that we don't need to fear the outcome of any free and fair elections in the country, but we do need to be very concerned in the United States about what is to come if it's seen as an American validation of a rigged election. 
And as uh, the, my fellow witnesses have said, I think an investment needs to be made, a long-term investment in Pakistani civil society. We're seeing the students now stepping up for really one of the first time in some years, uh, the lawyers and the political parties. But an investment needs to be made in developing those groups. Mike, just to, just to follow up on that, uh, Mr. Baird, in terms of the two, tools that are at your disposal in terms of the election monitoring. Uh, what kind of cooperation have you gotten? Uh, what resources do you have at your disposal? And at what point would you be in a position to give an assessment uh, as to, again, prior to the election as whether or not you thought you had the resources and tools available to actually make a fair judgment? Because it gets to the, the point you just raised. We do not want to be in a position here of sort of certifying uh, the fairness of a, a, an election or suggesting we think it was fair if, in fact, we're not in a position to do so and many in the country see it as unfair. So what resources are at your disposal and at what point do you think you'd be able to say that uh, the election monitoring uh, that is going to be put in place will be adequate to m make a determination on the fairness of the election? Well, the resources to date that we've been operating on were provided by the National Endowment for Democracy, and they have been our only funding source in the country until very recently for this election, when we did receive USAID money and State Department money to conduct the election observation itself. A 65-person observation delegation is fairly large. However, in a nation of 160 million people and tens of thousands of uh, polling stations, you can see that won't go very far. That's why I think it's uh, important that the work of our sister organization, National Democratic Institute, to train the political parties to try to get as many of their own observers there. That's been very, very important to this. There are Pakistani groups uh, that are also domestic observers. As I understand it, as of today, they've still not been given credentials by the government, allowing them, although they're a very well-established NGO, to go out and try to cover some of these polling stations on election day and record their findings. So uh, there's one more thing that could be done, is encourage the government of Pakistan to allow its own domestic groups to participate in the election as monitors. Uh, the resources for the future, as I say, I think we need to uh, try to commit more uh, to these very sectors and try to do that possibly through our USAID programs as opposed to simply through the Pakistani government. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Chair. You know, following on that, that thought, there, there are a number of areas of that country that are uh, deemed uh, not particularly safe by the Pakistani government itself and by our own government on that. Um, are you going to be able to get into those areas of the IRI to monitor situations there in Baluchistan um, and, and Peshawar and, and up in the uh, Fatah areas? During the pre-election assessment, we were able to get into Baluchistan. We did not go to the frontier. I believe uh, a few weeks before, NDI was able to visit Peshawar during their pre-election assessment. We don't really know as of now what's going to be happening on election day. There are certainly parts of the country that I think are just no-go for us. But for the most part, I think we're going to see a fairly uh, good distribution in all four provinces of our international observer team. Mr. Schneider, tell us a little bit about the uh, alleged role of the intelligence services and their impact and intimidation, and, or at least alleged intimidation, and also the local uh, mayors and local authorities, what their role is in the election, what the concerns are around that. There, there are three things, it seems to me, that are a major concern. Um, you've already had the parties file complaints with the Election Commission about uh, the intelligence services uh, having threatened, in some cases detained, um, their party leaders at the local level. Um, you've had the uh, decision by the, um, uh, the, the newly named high court judges in several of the provinces to move uh, hundreds of local district judges around. Remember I mentioned that the, they are going to be essentially the, the electoral uh, voting uh, managers on election day. Well, they've moved them out of their districts and sent them elsewhere. So you, you have a real concern about those kinds of administrative actions at the local level. The, the state governments um, have responsibility for the local administration. And again, there have been evidence, you have some of it on your screen, of, um, of the use of government resources and government security forces campaigning for Musharraf. So all of these things 
are major concerns that the parties have. And up to this point, the Electoral Commission has not responded to any of these complaints. So it's a major concern. I'll also note that in, with FATA right now, the political parties, the moderate political parties, are not able to operate there. In the past, in fact, the PPP won in FATA in the, the distant past. But now they can't operate there, and the, the scenario is essentially now controlled um, by the, the religious parties. Uh, it, it's disturbing on that. And I guess, Mr. Garrett, again, not wanting to be unfair to you, but I keep coming back to this. How can you, can, can you conceive at all of an outcome of this where you deem these elections free and fair if that judiciary continues to be stacked the way it is? Is that even a prospect? Would that be something to say, well, everything else went well, but that didn't happen, therefore we put our imprimatur on it? Or take one of the other criteria, the fact that the media is still restricted. They suffer a possibility of a prison sentence up to three years uh, under this code of conduct if they criticize the president of the military. If that doesn't change between now and then, can you even fathom saying that those elections uh, were free and fair? It, it, I think we all know it's not about how transparent the boxes are on the election day. You can monitor that all day long. But if none of this in the lead-up changes, the voter polls don't change, the ability of the press to report, the parties to participate, people to get out of jail, the judiciary to not be stacked, is, I mean, is it really even fair to think that you might come up with any kind of a stamp of approval on this or just a report about how bad it went? Uh, let me just say that uh, we had our pre-election assessment team in the country the day the emergency was declared. And so as we saw, as we uh, became aware of the emergency being declared, it was one by one the television stations were disappearing. Uh, you were watching one and it was saying there are troops arriving in the Capitol. The Supreme Court has been surrounded, and then it went off the air, and you'd switch to the next station. And it would be on for a while reporting, then it would go, so forth and so on. However, during that entire period up to today, uh, there was still print media that was allowed, I think, to operate unfettered. It was the electronic media that was singled out. It was not the nation's substantial print media. If you look at our polling, it says that uh, it would be in a free and fair election over 50 percent of the seats would very likely go to a coalition of opposition parties. And there are places where these political parties have very solid basis of support. So I see these sorts of things and I think that once again we can't really prejudge because we don't know what might change in the next few weeks. Well, the one thing that has changed is now the print media is subject to the code of conduct as well. That's true, but uh, as recently as this past week when I was there, they were printing their cartoons against the president. They were uh, doing editorials that were very well written explaining what were the root issues with the emergency. Uh, I would just say that it's going to be very difficult. I think I said that in my statement earlier. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to imagine how this election is going to emerge with any type of a positive uh, reference given the things that we're already seeing going yeah. into it. It will be very difficult. No, all, all three of you probably have far more experience uh, on previous elections than the panel uh, up here does, but my understanding of the, the electioneering process that goes on out there is uh, the parties take to the streets, that they have large rallies, uh, that they motivate tens of thousands of people on that. There's serious constraints on that, as I understand it. How does that correct. affect the ability of any one party to really uh, go through what they've historically understood to be the way of conducting an election, uh, and what impact is that going to have, Senator Daschle? Well, Mr. Chairman, even by Pakistani standards, you are not going to have anything close to that resembling a free and fair election. I mean, it starts with the ISI and Mr. Schneider's description of the circumstances involving the pervasiveness of ISI involvement at the local level now with regard to the elections. You have the incompetence and the intransigence of the Election Commission. You have serious problems with regard to the freedom of the press. You have an inability on the part of parties to organize themselves and, and, uh, and have the public uh, demonstrations of support for candidates that you've just described. You have uh, a Supreme Court that is now uh, completely uh, 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 violated and, and, and not in, in, in standing within the country. So, as I say, even by past standards in Pakistan, uh, the circumstances today are, are uh, deplorable. And I don't see how you begin to change that. Having said that, I think the parties have come to the conclusion, what is, what is the alternative? What do you do in a situation like this when the alternative 
probably is Musharraf's uh, dictatorship for an in indefinite period of time and, and no opportunity for them to voice themselves and to be a participant in, in the political process, even under this corrupted basis. And so I think they probably made the right decision. But we all ought to know going in that this is really a joke in terms of the capacity uh, to produce any real results. Could I, Mr. Chairman, just on the sure. question of the press, just a couple of things. The last couple of days, the Pakistan Media Regulatory Authority has actually sent new letters to the owners of the private television stations. And they've basically uh, told them that uh, they're being watched and that they can't do live coverage, live programs that uh, deal with political issues in ways which, in their view, violate the, um, the code of conduct uh, in terms of um, ridiculing or in any other way. Uh, criticizing the president and the military, et cetera. And um, when you talked about intelligence agencies, they've also made it known to reporters that their actions are uh, clearly questionable uh, with respect to some of the things they've written as it relates to uh, individuals uh, like President Musharraf. Um, and you, you have to remember that during the emergency period, uh, the, the uh, then General Musharraf issued ordinances which increased the restrictions on both the uh, electronic media and the, on the, uh, the print media. And I was just looking at uh, ordinance number 14, for example, on the print media says, any material printed or graphic that defames, bring it into ridicule or disrepute the head of state, members of the armed forces, et cetera. These things are barred and they're potentially liable for three years in jail and, and major fines. So the kinds of restrictions that now exist are far greater than anything in the past. And obviously, this has an enormous chilling effect on all of the media. When we look at the unfortunate circumstance, I think it was the Garrett, you put it out in your testimony pretty well about uh, had we, we were looking at it and thinking there was a really good system over there, the parties would have a platform and stand for principles and, and policies. But historically, it's been very personality driven. Uh, and I don't think that's going to change overnight. So given the fact that there is now prohibited Nawaz Sharif from even participating, what does that do to at least one of those major parties and their prospects in this election? So I think it makes it almost impossible uh, for the full participation of the, of the parties of consequence to, to, to have the, uh, the, the, the ability to participate openly and freely. And I think once you've eliminated one of the major opponents in the political process, I mean, by the very nature of that act, uh, you're not going to get where you need to go, aside from all the other things we've already talked about. Thank you. Mr. Schneider, you, you made mention in your testimony that seven out of the 11 uh, original judges uh, on, on the, the high court, the highest court, uh, voted before they were displaced uh, that the action of, the, uh, of President Musharraf was, in fact, or General Musharraf at that time, that actually was, was unconstitutional. Correct. What's the effect of that order now? If that was put in place before they were actually removed or whatever, is it still valid? Has it been invalidated by his subsequent actions? Is it lingering out there? Uh, it's very difficult to say because, as I say, th that action took place before, right. the, um, the in before they were removed from their position. Um, and so the argument could be made that that still stands. There's some legal voices in Pakistan who say that's the case, that this was an unconstitutional act found unconstitutional by the court and that that court ruling still stands. Um, and uh, obviously, um, President Musharraf um, subsequently has said that no order by any court can void what he's done uh, during the emergency law period. But the entire order establishing the provisional constitutional order was declared unconstitutional by the court before it left office, right. before they were thrown out. Uh, so I think at some point in time, you're going to go back. I do think that at some point you will have a democratic government. I do think at some point they will find that the original orders by General Musharraf were unconstitutional and invalid, that he could not essentially bar the court from reviewing his actions. One of the prospects that the election has held uh, that uh, the PPP takes some, the PL, PML uh, N takes some, and the, of course uh, PMLQ takes some. Uh, are we looking at a deadlock? Uh, are we looking at a constitutional crisis? Uh, is there any way that we can estimate at this time? 
No, not at all. You've in traditionally parliamentary democracies, you have coalitions that are built after the elections because you rarely have an overwhelming majority. And so in this case, what you would seem likely is that you both will have the PPP and the PMLN plus some of the individual regional parties, uh, moderate regional parties, joining in an effective majority. Uh, if there is, as I say, if the polling that the IRI has done is reflected in the voting and those votes are counted, then I think you will have a, a uh, coalition that will be put together that will choose its prime minister. And at that point, I suspect that that majority in the parliament will challenge the actions that uh, President Musharraf has taken. And I'm in fact, may well challenge his reelection. I'm actually uh, somewhat encouraged for the reasons you've just heard uh, in the longer term, Mr. Chairman. I, I think the, the parties, the people of Pakistan are increasingly determined to deal with these challenges in a, in a very forceful and effective way. Uh, it's going to take some time. They're not, I don't think they're probably going to be able to do it in the next three weeks. But after the election and with the continued effort to organize and to form the coalitions that Mr. Snyder just addressed, uh, in the longer term, I think the kind of pressure internally and if it can be done as well from the external sources we've discussed today, especially the United States, I think we have reason to be optimistic about uh, the prospects in Pakistan ultimately. I think the unfortunate consequences, however, is uh, that coalition will be mindful of the fact that this United States government did not speak up as strongly as it should have for the people uh, and made their work harder for them. Uh, and I think also that all of that focus on resolving those internal problems will probably detract from efforts that could be used to focus on Taliban and al-Qaeda and other situations. So uh, it's unfortunate in that regard. Do either of my colleagues have any more questions, Mr. Yarmouth? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to get, it seems like what we, we've already decided here that in, in terms of our standards, there's no chance of a fair and free election there. And that um, the administration doesn't seem to um, want to at least set the stage by saying that's the case. I'm more concerned in this question as to what <coughs> measures the Pakistani people themselves will judge this election by. I mean, is, is it going to be a repudiation of the Musharraf rule? Um, I, 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 no, with all due respect, I don't think it's going to be, it doesn't sound like it's going to be whether Mr. Garrett's organization says it was a free and fair election. The process is probably uh, less significant than the outcome. But I'd like your answer. Uh, how are they going to judge whether it was a fair election or not? I would just say that the IRI poll was really helpful in creating sort of a picture of where the, the people of Pakistan are. I don't think anyone challenges the results of that poll. In fact, it's been cited all through the country and in the international community. And I think the degree to which people, in spite of all these problems, will, will find some, some confidence that the, the elections are, are at least accurate is whether they conform at all to the polling data that we know to be uh, fairly accurate. I mean, if they do, and if the results of the election reflect that degree of, of, of support for the political opposition that we know to exist, uh, I think we can salvage a lot in spite of the difficulties. I, I just add one other thing. I do believe that the Pakistani press is not cowed by the restrictions that have been placed on them. And I have no doubt at all that they will be monitoring the voting and to the degree that they also are reporting that voters are not permitted to vote who are on the rolls, that others can't find where they can vote, et cetera, they will be reporting that. And if there's a general judgment that there's been an unfair process at that time, along with the view that the outcome doesn't conform to anything that one would expect given the polling, then you will see a, a fundamental rejection. I just want to note here, this is not us. This is the, one of the leading newspapers in, in Pakistan, the, the newspaper Dawn. And it said that Pakistan is recognized as a genuine democracy and a law that goes with it. An independent judiciary, equality of all before the law, and a media that is truly free. The country can ill afford to go through another flawed exercise, which would be catastrophic. And the people who are the public opinion leaders in Pakistan, I think, will set the standards. And they're not our standards, they're their standards. They do believe in democracy. And I think that they will see 
what it has occurred up to this point, and they will see the outcome on Election Day, and they will make their own judgments. Mr. Van Hollen. Yes. Uh, just briefly, uh, again, um, as we discussed earlier on, I think that the reason the Bush administration has been so slow to push uh, Musharraf and, and others in Pakistan more quickly toward democratization has been this assertion made by Musharraf and essentially picked up uh, by the Bush administration that he is the only guy standing in the way uh, between you know, the radical uh, extremists uh, taking over uh, in Pakistan. And as you pointed out, uh, Mr. Snyder, in your testimony, if you look at some of the sort of basis of operation of Al Qaeda, we are talking about places like Quetta. We're talking about Peshawar. Uh, we've also saw that the deal uh, President Musharraf struck uh, many months ago uh, with the folks in the federally minister of tribal areas where it essentially entered into a non-aggression pact. And according to the, the publicly announced portions of the national intelligence estimate here, uh, which as you know represents the consensus position of all 16 U.S. intelligence agencies, that led directly to an increase uh, in Taliban strength uh, and increased sort of sanctuary uh, for Al Qaeda type elements. So I think it's very important as we go forward here that people in the United States understand that Musharraf is not the bulwark against extremism in Pakistan. And to the extent that you do not allow the political process to be more open, in fact, you strengthen the extremist element. So I would just like all of you to uh, suggest if you were to have the sort of secular opposition uh, win this election and we were to continue to push Musharraf to more openness and more democratization in the process, how would that affect uh, Pakistan's policy with respect to the Taliban and the, and, and the anti-Al-Qaeda effort? Would it, would it hurt that effort? Or would it strengthen it, or would it essentially represent it? I think it would definitely strengthen it. And there, there simply, as I said earlier, there would be no countervailing political pressures to try and go soft on the Taliban because they're linked to the religious parties, in the case of Musharraf, that I support. And so it, it seems to me that you're likely to see a much stronger, a unified uh, civilian leadership in the parliament pressing for the military to take actions against the Taliban and Al Qaeda. And, um, and both parties, both the PPP and the, the uh, PMLN, have stated in a coalition statement that they would go after Al Qaeda and the, and the Taliban uh, uh, terrorists. I agree. I, I think it would strengthen, it would strengthen this uh, struggle that their country and our country is in. I think a lot of the government's actions the repressive actions have emboldened the extremist elements within the, within the country and uh, given them all the more empowerment in these regions outside of the larger cities. And uh, I can't think of a better antidote to that than to empower the opposition, to give them an opportunity to work these areas and to say that we're going to take back our government and uh, in your name and in the name of people across the country, restore the, democ the democracy that Pakistan is proud of. Could I, could I just add one thing? Sure. Quetta you know, is in, in, in Balochistan, and one of the changes would be with the democratic government is that the, both PPP and the, 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 PML, the PMLN in. have stated that they would end the direct confrontation with the Baloch national parties in Balochistan. That would then provide a unified government aiming at restricting the Taliban and al-Qaeda in, in that province, which you don't have now. Thank you. I'd like to give each of you, uh, gentlemen, a, an opportunity to make some uh, overarching closing statement if you, if you care to. Senator? Can I ask a question? Excuse me. Uh, this is a public hearing uh, for a committee of Congress and for no, the panelists. Public. And your representatives are doing it. No, you can't. And I just appreciate it if you would uh, let us continue. Senator? Well, Mr. Chairman, I just, first of all, I want to reiterate how pleased I am that you're holding this hearing because I think it sends the message that there are people within this government who are very deeply concerned about circumstances in Pakistan, and I think that's exactly the message we need to send to the people there today. 
I think we need to keep the pressure on, not only from the administration, but from the Congress. And you're doing that in part with this hearing. I think we ought to go back and look at the conditionality of aid in the future. And we shouldn't wait for a long period of time for us to revisit the question uh, as to how far we should go with regard to conditionality. And third, I think it is important for us to watch this very carefully and respond as quickly as we can once the elections have been held. Thank you. Mr. Garrett. Uh, let me also thank you for letting uh, me appear before you today. I think the people of Pakistan are watching what is done here, what is done in the United States. And I just wanted to take that opportunity to say that it's been consistent in our work with the people there that they desire democracy. And I think they will see this as an important contribution towards being placed back on the roadmap to democracy. So thank you. Mr. Schneider. Uh, I agree with everything said. And I, again, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding the hearing. I hope that you consider holding a hearing early in January on the same issue, on what did the elections show and where do we go from here. And I would just simply note something that uh, today in, in uh, Islamabad and in, 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 in uh, Pakistan, the newspapers are giving a great deal of attention to what the Congress did in terms of conditionality. So that they are watching what the United States is doing. And it is crucial that the message from the United States, both parties and from the administration as well as the Congress be, that the United States stands for dem democracy and the United States believes that democracy is in the interests of Pakistan and the United States. Well, thank you. you you'll be comforted to know that we, we do intend to have a hearing on the financial aspect of it. Certainly in January, we can certainly do a recapture of what happened on the elections as well. We think it's important and we have a good bipartisan group on this panel uh, and elsewhere that believe strongly that Congress has to speak up uh, given the silence of the administration. We have to try to get the administration to speak up as well. Uh, I want to just publicly thank each of the three of you gentlemen. I'm not sure the public is aware of the sacrifice of your own personal lives that you take out with your time traveling, making the observations and coming back and sharing them. It's important for us to have people willing to do that. Uh, make observations on the ground and come back. Mr. Garrett, in particular, I note that you just got home this past weekend, and right after Christmas, you're going back again and staying through the election. So thank you for your service, Senator and Mr. Schneider, as well. Uh, your testimony here today has been incredibly helpful to have us build a record to point us in a direction where we go from here. Uh, and we thank you for all of your, uh, your assistance on that and for your public service. And we look forward to the hearings in January as well. Thank my colleagues for their uh, input as well. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Merry Christmas. 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 Merry Christmas